So we all have our, our small theories, we try to make grand theories and we often test our theories in practice and uh, scientists are sometimes disappointed because their theories are not, are not fully accepted in real life. So, as criminologist, I see often the problem of criminological theory, which is beautiful to read, but when it comes to crime prevention, those, those ideas often fail and do not provide uh, uh, a good answer for solving everyday problems. Some of them do, but the majority of of theory is not applicable at all. We often know what is wrong, but we rarely know what to do to reduce crime and other, other social problems. So, uh, I come from, uh, from the Faculty of Criminal Justice and Security at the University of Maribor in Slovenia. We have 1,500 students, uh, 27 instructors and uh, about 60 adjunct staff from all walks of life, from top chiefs of criminal justice institutions to, I would say, uh, ordinary field, field officers in criminal justice institutions. We also have representatives of NGOs who, who present their views on on justice and the rule of law and other issues related to law enforcement to our students. So we are also well known for organizing public lectures of international renowned professors from all around the world. And we also invite, invite top police chiefs uh, and uh, uh, presidents of uh, courts and uh, other, other top experts to, to talk to our students about their realities of criminal justice institutions and crime realities, etc., etc. So what is going on at the moment from my perspective? So we are now facing internaliz internationalization of knowledge, which means that we cannot offer or provide our students only local or regional or national knowledge, but we have to go beyond national, national boundaries. So it's, it's mainly about uh, publishing in English, because English has become lingua franca in the field of science. And uh, a colleague of mine has recently published a paper uh, uh, titled Publish in English or Perish. Because, you know, if, if a scientist is not able to participate in an international scientific community, one actually doesn't exist uh, internationally. And then the next, the next uh, challenge is internationalization of research. So in the past, in the past we mainly did national research. Now it's common, it's a common practice that we are uh, it's a must to be involved in international research projects. So it's about learning from each other. It's about learning about different scientific or academic traditions. So it's, it's, it's a huge challenge for us because we, we come from these different disciplines. We are used to uh, applying different uh, research methods and we actually are dealing with different levels of a certain problem uh, we, we, are, we are studying. And the next challenge for us is also internationalization of teaching. So it's, we started, we have recently started the exchange of students from all around the world. So for instance, we just concluded a three year exchange project with four Australian university. We, we exchanged 15 students uh, from our faculty with 15 students uh, from uh, four Australian universities and 30 students from Australia went to other European universities and we, we, we learned a lot about different academic environments, about different expectations of students and uh, we also learned about, about how curricula is understood by, by our students and Australian students because our students still allow our professors to be academically free 
And in Australia, it's considered that uh, a curriculum is a kind of a contract, so because students pay a lot for the study set, etc., etc. So it's a, it's a different, it's a different academic culture. So we are now applying for international exchange projects with the United States, Canada, and, and other parts of the world, and this is a huge challenge for us, for our students, and also for our professors to, to learn to learn from each other. So some recent experiences, so in relation to all these, those three factors, uh, we, are, we, are, we are facing something what I call uh, academics as super women and super men, because we are expected to do everything and anything, to do all administrative work, to facilitate students, to write in English, to, to, to be able to communicate and cooperate with practitioners and politicians and be, be active in policy making processes and contribute to our local community development, etc., etc. So there are huge, huge expectations about our work. And the, the Bologna uh, Convention on Higher Education is also putting a huge pressure on us because what, what has already been said, it's about employability, it's about topicality, it's about, you know, uh, the inclusion of students into research, uh, uh, involvement of practitioners in teaching, etc., etc. So it's a, it's, a really, it's a really huge challenge. So that's, that's what we are, we are facing at the moment. So to conclude my, my introduction, I used to be a national correspondent to the Council of Europe between 2002 and 2004 in a project responses to everyday violence in a democratic society where I learned at least four different languages, but all was in English. So as a national correspondent, I was a representative of the Slovenian government to the Council of Europe in that project. So I was representing our government and I was given a mandate to, to be active, actually to participate in this project. When I got there, I was, I was selected, actually I was elected to be a member of an expert group. So I had to learn a language of expertise uh, and we were also asked to draft the final report. And I was, I was privileged to be a member of a field working group which visited eight European cities and learned about how crime prevention programs were implement, implemented in those cities. So that was a first-hand practical experience. And in communication with practitioners and representatives of, of the Council of Europe and experts and national correspondents and others, I actually learned that we often talked about the same subject the same problem, but we used different languages. And the length of documents was also quite different. When it was about scientific reports, it was about big books and uh, quite many words, you know, and when it was, when it was, it was about uh, administrative documents, it was an abridged version of the previous document, and it was, when it was about the resolution, it was a very short document which, uh, from a managerial point of view, actually resembles executive summary of a, of a project. So, very, very different levels, different languages, and different challenges for, for people involved in, in such projects. So, and uh, uh, we, we, were, we were listening uh, uh, a speech about impact, uh, impacting knowledge uh, within the UN, but uh, as uh, a member of scientific community, we are also, we are also involved, actually pressured by another impact factors, which is publishing in SSCI journals, uh, in SCI journals, and in other uh, uh, publications with international impact, which is not easy for non-English speaking people. So it's another challenge, and it's, uh, it's, it's related to learning new language skills. So that's, that's also what we are, we are trying to gain. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm also teaching a subject called Elements of Crime Control Policy. Uh, and uh, we, have, we have learned, this also goes uh, 
uh, this is actually, I can add to, to some thoughts uh, shared with us before, that scientists are often too, too slow for fast, fast practitioners and policy makers. So it's about uh, giving recipes for solving societal problems yesterday, not today, not even tomorrow. So we are, we are often put under a, a huge pressure to give, to give very simple answers for for very for solving uh, of very complex problems. So this is this is this is another challenge. My name is Sandeep Chawla. I'm director of research and policy in the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. Um, I come to this conference with a peculiar qualification that I've been skating the thin ice of being part bureaucrat, part academic for the last 30 years. Uh, and I'm still not sure what I am. Um, I use the convenient position of donning the two hats when it suits me. So there are times when I'm obliged to be a bureaucrat and a manager in the United Nations. Uh, there are times when I can be an academic. I'm very careful with the two positions. But we have to try and make a balance between these two simply because of the nature of the kind of work that we do in the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. Um, for, for both areas, academia as well as the UN, there is a very dangerous tendency. It's usually ascribed to the academic sitting in their ivory tower and dealing with their realm of theory. But it's also ascribed frequently to the United Nations of being a internalized navel-gazing bureaucracy which has very little interest in what is happening outside its own world. And in fact, um, these difficulties in academia as well as the UN can be surmounted and they can be surmounted in ways in which we've tried to do over the last few years by adopting the role in, in the UN of being the honest broker of data and information which we try and provide to the world at large using the resources of academia as well as our own resources but using them in the balanced way in which you don't allow one to undercut the other. In other words, we have our limitations. Most of our work is based upon government-provided data. And if we only use that data in our conventional intergovernmental forum, since the United Nations is above all else an organization of member states, and if we provide this data and the analysis that we draw uh, from that data to an intergovernmental forum, meaning a collection of governments who are our real masters in the UN. The danger, of course, is that any conclusions you come to from this data can be vetoed by the interests of our member states because they are sovereign and they tell us what to do. And all of you know that the membership of the United Nations is seriously divided on some of the most important issues in the world. Um, and if the UN stands for peace, security and development, then you have only to look at the 200 odd member states and see how many different views you have on peace, security and development. So we become a consensus bound organization because of our membership. But how do we avoid this? by being an honest broker and by doing something which was traditionally done only by academics but which in the United Nations we've started doing as well is publish or perish. The minute you publish your work and your data and you put it before public scrutiny you have already moved beyond the limitations of what you would get out of the intergovernmental discourse. So, if I write a report for one of my intergovernmental bodies, which we have, uh, we are a tiny organization, but we have two intergovernmental bodies, the Commission on Narcotic Drugs and the Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. Um, 
If I write a report for one of these commissions, that report stays within the realm of what is called parliamentary documentation in the UN and member states can veto it. If I take that same data and I publish it and put it before the scrutiny of the world at large, including the academic community, I have suddenly gone well beyond the limitations of the intergovernmental discourse to put this discussion up before public scrutiny at large and that makes the position infinitely stronger but also much more dangerous which is why I spoke in the beginning of this discussion of skating on thin ice. Now if as we all know, I think it's, it, it would be a, a platitude to say that the world is changing for better or for worse. It's in some ways for the better, in some ways for the worse. And unfortunately, we have to concern ourselves with the worse part of it, not the better part of it. And so we have to concern ourselves with issues like drugs, like crime, like terrorism, and so on. And these cause us a certain amount of difficulty because we have to deal with it at the three levels at which in our organization we deal with everything. We have a set of normative, legal, treaty-based concerns because unlike many parts of the UN, our work is based upon international conventions. We have three for drugs elaborated between the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. We have two new ones for organized crime and against corruption, which were elaborated in, in this millennium. And this gives us the normative basis of all of our work. It's very strong and it's very powerful, but it puts on us a certain set of limitations, but it gives us a lot of strengths as well. We have an analytical function, uh, what I am responsible for in our organization, uh, research and policy development, in which our main focus is to try and be an honest broker, providing to the world at large um, the data and the information and the analysis, which will primarily show to the world how the problem is evolving how it is changing, what is the main trend, is it getting better or is it getting worse. If I were to ask the question of this room, as I've asked in many different uh, forums all over the world, is there any way of assessing whether the world's drug problem, illegal drug problem, is getting better or getting worse? I can guarantee you there will be as many answers to that question as there are people in this room. And that is because we all experience the problem differently, we all perceive it differently, and our role is to try and be an honest broker of that information, put out the data and information as best you can, and leave everybody, individuals, communities, policy makers, governments, to draw their own conclusions from it. And the second reason why we need to be honest brokers and purveyors of this information is we need most of all to be able to have the basis, the empirical basis, the empirical evidence on which we design our programs because we are a technical assistance and a development agency in some respects, which gives you the third part of our work. We call it because of our, uh, it's partly to do with unfortunate uh, institutional history, we call it operational work and that gives to a lot of people the impression that we are some kind of an enforcement or intelligence agency, we are neither. What we mean by operational work is technical assistance provided in the field and that is the third pillar of our work. So the normative, the analytical, the operational, merge together to try and give us a coherent organization. Now, what we try and do in these areas um, is first and foremost deliver to the world at large the honest broker assessment of 
the world's drug situation in terms of production, in terms of trafficking and in terms of consumption of illegal drugs. Um, with that in mind, we produce an annual report which is called the World Drug Report. Uh, and this report is something which is, generally speaking, now treated as the standard source of statistical reference on any dimension of drugs in the world at large. Uh, those words I just used, standard source of statistical reference, are not my words. Um, they are words drawn from a journal which is committed to a policy on drugs which is completely the opposite of what the UN stands for. Um, this is a journal called The Economist, which as you know, or as some of you know, is in favor of liberalization of drugs and legalization of drugs, which the UN conventions are completely against. But the fact that a journal like The Economist can call our publication the standard source of statistical reference is both a compliment to this uh, particular publication, but it also indicates its real nature, is we try and stay out of uh, policy discussions in this report, merely provide a trend analysis from one year to the next. So if you are looking for trying to get an idea of the size, the dimensions, the evolution of the world's drug problem, uh, you can't do worse than look at the annual World Drug Report. Uh, you can find it on our website and there are some copies at the back of the room uh, for those of you who haven't seen it before. Um, in addition to this, there are a whole range of studies and publications on the drug side of the problem, which we put out every year. Uh, these are either reports of surveys trying to give the world at large an assessment of the size of the production of the two most uh, dangerous drugs in the world, cocaine and heroin, and of the one which is rapidly catching up as becoming uh, not bother too much about cannabis, so a lot of countries do what is called decriminalize cannabis and uh, don't prosecute cannabis offenses. On the other side of the, the issue, which is crime, uh, this is a more difficult area for us to work in for the simple reason that when you look at conventional crime, the situation divides the membership of the UN even more than drugs does because domestic, drug, uh, domestic crime situations dealing with homicide, theft, burglary, counterfeiting, etc. are issues which put countries into some sort of a league table internationally in which very often countries simply look at it as whose murder rate is higher or whose crime rate is higher or whose theft or burglary rate is higher and this causes difficulties between countries because ultimately for governments the level of domestic crime is something which generates so much public anxiety. So while the UN does do uh, a crime trend survey which we do every two years uh, we send out a questionnaire to governments, we get together the data and we publish it as data without very much analysis. The place where we now have a real area in which we can work as honest broker is on the phenomenon of transnational organized crime. For that we have a convention um, which was concluded at the beginning of this millennium. This convention contains not only action against transnational organized crime, but also protocols against the smuggling of migrants, against human trafficking, as well as against firearms. These protocols in this convention give us a basis to work on the transnational dimensions of organized crime. And with that in mind, we have done a lot of work over the years trying to develop the knowledge base 
for providing objective, reliable data and information on this. Last year, we published our first uh, report on transnational organized crime, which is called the Globalization of Crime. There are again copies at the back of the room for those of you who haven't seen it before. Um, the purpose of this was to look at transnational dimensions of organized crime and, and look at the flows by which transnational organized crime was organized. Um, we tried to ask the questions of what is the nature of these markets, how is trafficking conducted in these markets, who are the actual traffickers, how big is the flow, what are the implications for a response globally. Um, and one of the things that we found very clearly in this, we looked at eight or ten different issues in, in this report as a transnational organized criminal activity. We looked at trafficking in persons, the smuggling of migrants, the international smuggling and trafficking of heroin and cocaine, of firearms, of environmental resources such as wildlife or timber. Um, we looked at counterfeit goods and counterfeit medicines. We looked at piracy and we looked at cybercrime. This is the whole range of issues covered in this report. And then we looked at examples of areas where the governance and stability of areas and countries is threatened by these flows of transnational organized criminal activity. In this report, we chose uh, three different areas to look at. We looked at the impact of the cocaine market um, on the Andean countries, on South America and on Middle America, and then on West Africa. Uh, we looked at the impact of heroin on Southeast Asia, Central Asia, and Southwest Asia. We looked at the impact of mineral smuggling on Central Africa. We looked at the impact of piracy, maritime piracy, on the Horn of Africa and its international implications. Now, we came to three main conclusions about this and our further work is going to be um, built or informed by these three main conclusions. The first is even though it's more attractive to look at organized crime in terms of organized crime groups and mafias because mafias uh, generally create in the public imagination uh, a question of an issue of anxiety and imagination. Uh, it's more important to look at the market because the market is there and the groups in it change. So it's more important to look at the market. The second conclusion we came to is you need to regulate much better the licit trade in order to control the illicit one because there are whole gray areas in the international economy which are insufficiently regulated, for instance, counterfeit goods or counterfeit medicines. And the consumer needs to know whether he or she is buying something counterfeit or real and these distinctions are not possible in the world. And finally, you need for this a definitely an international response because as you squeeze in one area and exercise controls, it stretches over to the other one. The best example is 10 years ago, the main market for cocaine was North America, the United States, with the production in the Andean countries. Today, half the cocaine that is produced in the Andean countries is consumed in Europe, and the main transit point for that cocaine is West Africa. So the world is changing and to keep up with this is our main focus. And that's the, the way in which our work as the honest broker of the world at large works out. I hope you will get more details from my um, colleagues speaking about the other dimensions of our work. Thank you very much. I joined the UNODC um, office um, from a background in law enforcement and I spend a lot of my uh, work focusing upon um, undertaking the assess assessing the capacities and capabilities of, of law enforcement um, authorities in member states to implement 
the obligations under the um, conventions that we are um, supporting. This morning um, I will talk about um, one way we have addressed capacity building and that is in the area of training. Traditionally, um, when I first joined the UNODC, um, we had an ongoing and, um, program of training or capacity building for law enforcement um, agencies and that was um, fairly universal I think in most um, international or um, most international training or bilateral training and that was where you rounded up the usual suspects and then you um, organized a translator or interpreter and then we brought in outside expertise to to deliver that training and um, then we would have a situation where um, you, you, you always had a filter between the expert and the recipients um, because of language. We also found too that, well, and what was also common practice was that if we were working in, in, um, with one country and, and, and we had a, an ongoing program for, um, say, for two or three years um, with a series of um, capacity building training to, do, to support them. Um, for the first training session we might have, we might bring in Germany. The next one we might bring in the US. The one after will, might be from Australia, et cetera, et cetera. So there was also um, an element of, or disjointed element as well, shall we say. It wasn't that, we, that the training or the methodology was not up to um, a high standard. It was more um, the difference in approach and, and um, and uh, capacities that were be that were the, were the dislocator in that. So we worked, we thought about it, um, and some clever soul, I was not part of that, um, came up with the um, concept of computer-based training, or putting the good concepts, or the, the putting down, or laying down a, a framework of good practices um, in a you know sort of universal um, approach and media that could be used um, anywhere in the world. So around 1997 we commenced our computer-based training program and since then um, we have developed about 120 hours of training syllabus so basically we can lock people in a room for, two, for more than two weeks now, um, eight hours a day and cover a very broad spectrum of the, um, of the mandate um, of UNODC. The subject matter we cover um, obviously does relate specifically to the conventions. Um, initially, it, um, back in 1997, the focus was on illicit, on illicit drug interdiction. And, um, but then since the um, coming um, into being of the Transnational Organised Crime Convention in 2000 and the um, Corruption Convention, um, the, the syllabus um, that have been developed have, have expanded um, with, the, with the conventions. But to give you some examples or some idea of, of the subject matter that we, we cover, um, there's a border interdiction at land, sea and air borders. We look at issues around risk management, selection um, and searching. Information gathering um, and developing that information into operational intelligence for responding to, to threats. Um, searching techniques, interviewing techniques, um, the fundamentals of illicit drug identification and, and their testing. And now we're moving into human trafficking um, and, how, and this investigation, its concepts. Um, and money laundering, a very key element of the, um, the global response to addressing um, cross-border crime. We have, probably a bit more now, that around seven, established 70 e-learning centres around the world. Um, and the program is rolled out in now more than 36 languages. The texts or the syllabus are standardised and we like to call them internationally benchmarked. Um, and when we deliver them to you in your specific, specific country, they are localised to your conditions in the sense that 
Um, if you are in Southeast Asia, then the imagery, the, the uniforms, the, the faces, the scenes outside the windows in, in the syllabus relate to Southeast Asia. Similarly, if you are sitting in Africa, then the uniforms, the, the people, the, the, the documentation and the, and the imagery outside the windows and the, inside the offices relate to your region. But I think the, probably the most exciting thing um, and the most effective part about our computer-based training program has been the fact that we have eliminated, eliminated the middleman. And the middleman was the interpreter. Because now we deliver um, the, 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 the concepts and the ideas and the practices directly in your language. So there is no need for that long pause between um, somebody talking at you and then having that um, either well or poorly translated into your language um, for you to pick up on. It's also um, been an interesting learning experience for us too because we have seen that, um, well first of all, obviously students learn at their own pace. Um, in some cultures where face is very important, we found that um, it was also a way of getting around the fact that if you had a mixture of experience in a training room between the, the young and enthusiastic and the, and the grey-haired and the experienced, um, often the older, um, more senior staff were probably loath to answer questions or ask questions and show their ignorance, whereas when they're talking purely to a computer screen um, or responding to the questions and, um, and uh, scenarios in a computer screen, then there was no such um, exposure to, to ridicule, either real or imagined. So um, that has been a, a very positive aspect of it. And just so that we know that they're not um, sitting there doing nothing for the, for the week or whatever that their courses are, um, we have um, arranged the, the program so that people are tested when they first start and they're tested at the end of the, of the syllabus or module rather that they are working on. And so that gives, a, gives the, the, the training academy or, um, an indication of the, of the knowledge gain. We can measure that um, and that the person has completed successfully the course that they were on and then can move on to the next, um, the next module or, or level. We've also provided um, a learning management system with it because um, we found that most of our clients were, um, they all had training academies of some sort and in differing, in differing areas of sophistication and resource. Um, we will generally um, deliver the whole program in your language, um, complete with computers. All you really have to do is provide a space. Um, and then we will um, train one of your officers in, in the training school as the, as the um, learning management coordinator and that person will manage the process of selection of staff, maintaining a roster, etc., and, and rotating people through the cycle of training. And, we, and in many cases we have introduced some sort of system, systemization or, um, or, or order to, to training because um, through providing a learning management system, um, we have enabled academies to keep track of who has been trained in what and when, as opposed to um, dragging, or dragging your new recruit off the street, um, giving them the basics, putting them in uniform and then pushing them out the door to do their job. Um, so those are some of the, I mean that's an example of the sustainability, or sustainable benefits rather, that have come out of this approach that we have adopted for frontline training. It's also, as you probably picked up on the fact, um, well suited for mass training. Place the standard classroom approach, but what it has done um, is has released um, the standard classroom approach to the next level of, of training. Um, to the more sophisticated um, or the, for the, and for the more experienced officers. So, so basically, whether you're in Azerbaijan or Zimbabwe, wherever the program happens to be, you, you, we will deliver um, a standardised approach of good practices to whatever agency happens to be running, running the courses, so that the same technical language um, is used from one side of the globe to the other, and you can expect more or less 
this, that they will under, that when you pick up the phone and call someone in another country or another region, that we hope that they will basically understand what it is you want, and the, and probably f follow a fairly fundamental approach, or similar approach rather, to what you're expecting them to do in response to support you. Um, the programs are sustainable by um, once they have been delivered. Um, pretty much all of our programs are, are time bound and, fun and funding bound so um, we had to look at a way of um, providing a, a capacity building um, resource that would stand on its own when we left, um, when the project was finished or the program was finished and the funding was, was exhausted. Um, so basically now in the 70 plus um, centres um, Th they run themselves, and as we get new uh, material done, um, they can just then we provide it to the, to the centres and update it that way. Um, although there is a fish hook there, and that is basically um, we need money to translate it in, into the local language, and so that sometimes can be can sometimes slow things down. Um, we've been fairly methodical about doing it. Um, People like me have not been involved in, in, in the initial process. We've gone and hired educators um, and subject matter experts to, to throw down, or to, to guide us in the approach of how to transfer knowledge, um, or transfer the knowledge we want um, to the recipients. Um, and then we've brought in the, the subject matter experts to empty their, their minds onto paper, and then we've turned that paper into um, interactive audio um, training material. Um, it's been our policy, we've learned that we should deliver it to training schools. We originally thought that we should have do it on CD-ROMs and, and give them out like confetti, um, and that every home should have one and that every officer should have one when he's not working at, the, at, the, at their job, they should be sitting down reading this. But um, we found that um, this didn't work. People really, when they finished doing their job, wanted to go and read the newspaper or, or have a lie down. They didn't really want to start exercising their minds um, on any education matters. So the best way, we got the best results by getting people in, away from their work area, putting them back into, into the training academy environment so they, they weren't distracted and they were focused upon the skills that they were trying to, to pass on. Um, the future for us, we, th we see it as being, um, having an internet base on, the, on an internet platform. Um, at the moment, and again, mo in most of the, of the client countries we work in this with, um, their internet is not um, strong enough, or whatever the term is, to support um, the, in, the media rich uh, material that we have included in the um, syllabus. So pretty much all of our um, program is, 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 is arranged around physically installing in your um, training academy um, the syllabus and then letting you run with it. Though I am aware that in a couple of countries, and, and Turkey is one of them, is that the Turks, um, the national police there, have um, run it across the country to about ten different training academies across Turkey using the internet um, as the medium for, for training and they, and they run it from the police uh, training headquarters. I think um, that's, in a very brief nutshell, is um, an overview of, of one approach, or the, an approach that we have adopted to, to lay down um, the fundamentals, shall we say, um, and good principles of, respond, of law enforcement and responding to implementation of the conventions that we, um, that we work with. Thank you very much.